distances. So I'm going to talk about bosonization of file farming. So this is the outline, introduction, what are wild fermions, charge and topological charge duality, and then out of this duality I show how to get generalized statistics in D, in one, two, and three spatial dimensions. General structure of bosonization in arbitrary dimension, and then the more specific bosonization of wire fermion. Then these are some applications, and at the end, I'll talk about a possible bosonization of electrons. So the basic references for this talk are my book, which was published in 2017, and this paper, which is specific about bosonization of wire fermions, the 2017 paper, and uh, this is my PhD thesis work where we introduced the relation between order disorder duality and generalized statistics. By the way, two years before Wilczek did with, with the name of Anion. And this is application which I did about bosonization of the Dirac fermion in two spatial dimensions. So I'll start with this phrase by Hermann Weil, which I think is very nice, He's speaking about the beauty and truth in physics. <laughs> he, he said, I usually choose the beautiful, but I'll, I'll try to convince you that history of physics have, has proved that beauty usually becomes truth in physics. So what are wild fermions? So when we, oh, there's some, when we, we think about the Lorentz group in three spatial dimensions, it has six generations generators, which are three angular momentum and three generators of Lorentz boost. Th there is a, a something wrong here. I don't know why it, these arrows are showing. But, okay, if I combine the J and K generators in this J plus IK, J minus IK, define this M and N operator. The M and Ns commute, and among themselves, they have angular momentum commutation rules. So uh, if, if you want to study the irreducible representations of this, we must look at the eigenvalues of the Casimir operator the operators which commute with all generators. And these are, of course, mi, mi, as in angular momentum, is j squared is the Casimir operator. Here we have two, and so the irreducible representations are labeled by this m and n, which are integers and semi-integers. So these are the irreducible representations. The spin of the representation is the sum m plus n, because if we sum this m and n, we get j. Okay. Uh, and the dimension is 2m plus 1 plus times 2m pl plus 1. Parity and time reversal operations take m into n and m into m. So what we call wild fermions are the one half zero and zero one half representation, irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. They have spin a half and dimension two. And parity and time reversal operations take left fermions into right 
experiments and vice versa. That's why the operation of parity and time reversal, uh, these, uh, these operations are not defined in for wild fermions. In the same way that the operation of division is not defined in the set of integer numbers. We must enlarge it. I, I'm sorry, but I don't know for, yeah. Yeah, it's, well, what, uh, the guy on the, on that room has, yeah. Thank you so much. The thing you can drive here. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. It's very unpleasant. Like in football match, I think there will be discount, additional time. Thank you so much. Okay. Sure. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, now it's back. So you see, the Lorentz group has six generators, three angular momentum and three generator of Lorentz boost. So if you combine J and K in this way here, we get M and N, which commute among themselves. And among them, the M's, we have angular momentum commutation rules. So this means the irreducible representations are going to be labeled by the eigenvalues of the Casimir operators, which are this one, like angular momentum. And these eigenvalues have the, the integer or semi-integer values. And then the irreducible representations have spin m plus n in this dimension. And P and T operation, uh, operations take M into N and N into M. So that's why it's not defined. What we call wild fermions are the, these two left and right, one half zero and zero and half representations. And therefore, the P operation, for example, is not defined in the realm of wild fermions in the same way that uh, operation of division is not defined in the set of integers. We must enlarge it. So the dimension is two, so both these twin representations, left and right, has two components. And what is a Dirac fermion? Dirac fermion is not 
are any reducible representation of the Lorentz loop. It is a direct sum of these two left and right representations. So a direct fermion is made out of two left and right wild fermions. And therefore, it has four components, because each of these has two. And then, for a, a direct field, direct representation, we can define the parity and time reversal symmetry. They, they require direct form. OK. So Dirac and wild fermions, let's take uh, the massless Dirac field in three spatial dimensions. If we use the so-called wild representation of Dirac matrices, which is given by this, each term here is a two by two block, so these matrices are four by four. Sigma i are the Pauli matrices. So if we, so this sigma mu and sigma mu bar are defined in this way. So uh, they transform under U1 symmetry like this, the left and R, and the left, okay, the left and R go with opposite phase. So these are the currents which are conserved as a consequence of this U1 symmetry. Now, a mass term of a direct field is written this way. So again, a mass term, in order to have massive particles, we need both the left and right vial fermion. So again, if you have just a, a vial representation, we cannot have mass. That's why we have this Dirac cone. These are massless. So in the presence of electric and magnetic field, this while uh, excitations have a very interesting behavior because even though the total number of left plus right excitations does not change in time, the difference between them is may change in time provided we have a peculiar electric and magnetic field present. So, and this is crucial for the observation of our final association. So, this is taken from presentation here. So if we have a vial semi-metal, we have two different, the, 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 the cones are no, non-degenerate, whereas in the direct semi-metal, in this case, the, we have a superposition of two direct cones. Now, OK. So this is another view. A direct point would be something like that. Uh, of course, a direct field can be massive. And then in this case, instead of a cone, we have two hyperboloid. And we have a gap. Observe here, represented three momentum components. So the vial points, we see the two cones is free. These figures are taken from this reference. So here we can see, so if you have a uh, vial excitation, the two cones corresponding to the left and right fermions will split either in momentum or in energy, creating this. So if, if we look at cuts at these cones. So here are the two cones separated. And if you take cuts 
along these cones, we have these figures here, these peculiar figures, which are predicted on the basis of this circle here. Now, I in 2015, that's why I say beauty has become truth, we, in this phosphorus, tantalum, semi-metal, which are three-dimensional, this is the brillouin zone. So in ARPES measurement, you see, you see exactly those cuts which are predicted. These are the predictions. And these are the observance. So you see here, for example, this is the Fermi surface. This is the cone, so you see here. So, okay, so this is, this is vile fermions. So why bosonization? Why are you going to bosonize wild fermions? So, okay. So, if you look at the particles that we know, we have, mat we can divide particles in matter particles and interaction mediators. Like electrons, quarks, and so on, they are all fermions. And the interaction mediators, like photons, gluons, Zs, and Ws, even the Higgs are bosons, named after the Indian physicist Bose. So why is that? So why matter is fermionic and the mediators are bosonic? So if you go to Wikipedia, if you find, we find this. Although in the current state of particle physics, the reason for this issue is unclear. So, I, I don't think there is an answer for this question, but it is rather intriguing that there is the, this division. Now, as early as in 1960, 62, there is a pioneer work by Skirm, which try, try to gap this di division. Because at that time, the strong interaction was available, was the Yukawa interaction, according to which the intera strong interaction between uh, neutrons and protons was mediated by the exchange of mesons. By the way, uh, a Brazilian physicist participated in the experimental discovery of the meson pi, Cesar Lack. Uh, and so what Skirm did, he, di he wrote a whole theory in terms of the meson field and the hadrons, like protons and neutrons, were topological excitations of the meson field. That's why the name Skirmian, that was generalized to so many frameworks nowadays. So, but he was the first to bridge this gap. So one of the interests in bosonization is that maybe try to solve this puzzle. But there are many other reasons, even practical reasons, because we can get the exact solution of nonlinear non theories. I'll, I'll give soon an example. We can provide a weak interaction description of uh, another theory which is otherwise in the strongly interacting regime, new insights, and also a full quantum theory of topological excitation. You, you will see why. So the first example is, these are, I'm going to present here two icons of organization. One is the massive theory model, which is a completely nonlinear theory 
this is not in one spatial dimension, as a four Fermi interaction, and upon bosonization, it becomes the sine Gordon equation, where alpha is basically m, and beta relates to g in this way. So we see that we can go to uh, high coupling regime. We can connect the high coupling regime, large coupling regime, to the small coupling regime. So another icon is the electrodynamics, quantum electrodynamics of massless fermion in one spatial dimension, the so-called Schwinger model, which is nothing but Maxwell quantum electrodynamics of Dirac Fermi in one spatial dimension. So this upon bosonization, we, for example, we bosonize this in terms of a field phi, bosonize the current in terms of this, and if we integrate on the electromagnetic field, we have a free massive boson. So this was a, this was shown to be the first. This is exact. So we can understand for, this is exactly what happens in quantum chromodynamics, for example where we have quarks as input and the output is protons and neutrons and hadrons and so on. So also in condensed matter we have this, for, for example, in the quantum Hall effect, we have this electron gas interacting, strongly interacting electron gas and you have excitations with fractional statistics, fractional charge. So, okay. So, let's try to give you a general framework of how bosonization works. The, by the way, there is a myth that bosonization only works in one dimension. I'll show you that it's not true. So, first of all, the bosonic fields in one, two, and three spatial dimensions are respectively a scalar field, a vector field, and a tensor field. The Lagrangians are given by this for the scalar field. For the, this is going to be like Maxwell, and this is going to be the so-called Kalb-Ramon field. So for each of these, we can write a topological current. Topological currents are currents which are identically conserved. Their conservation does not follow from any symmetry, like, for example, in, in, as we have Nether theorem, that rotational invariance implies conservation of angular momentum, translation invariance, conservation of momentum, and so on. So these are identically conserved. And the topological charge is defined as usual as the integral spatial integral of the zero component of it. Okay. So we can write an operator which creates quantum topological excitations by this way. Coupling this topological current in this way. So we can show that this operator acting on the ground state is an eigenstate of the topological charge with eigenvalue is eigenvalue A. A here can be any. No, so we can show this. I'll, I'll give examples. So in one, two, and three dimensions, respectively, that expression becomes this, where pi is the momentum 
in, for a scalar, for a vector, and for a tensor field. Satisfying this canonical commutation relation. So using this, okay, using this, we can prove that. So we we have we know how to describe quantum topological excitation. Now we introduce what I call charge, but this is not real electric charge. This maybe should be called a particle number, which is, for example, in the case of one dimension, is this integral. Of, so if I take the zero component of it, it will integrate out the zero, this is a spatial and time delta. So if I integrate the zero component, it will leave a spatial delta, which is what we call a particle. So this can be generalized to two and three dimensions. And Okay. The charge is again is given by this expression here. Where Okay. Okay, so what I'm okay. <laughs> so this Sorry. So this expressions here can be written in terms of the H field, which I described before. By that expression. J and H. So in, th in this way, the sigmas are given by this expression. So these sigmas acting on the vacuum create eigenstates of this charge operator. So I have these two st structures, topological charge and charge. So I will skip this. So what this has to do is generalize statistics. So let's start in one spatial dimension and let's call psi dagger x the creation operator of a particle at point x. So if I commute psi x and psi y, I get a phase which, is, which defines what spin or statistic is. So if s is an integer, this is 1. If s is half integer, this is minus one. And if S is no, is neither an integer or a semi-integer, this is going to be a phase. But now, look, if I commute once again the right-hand side, I get a factor of two pi here. But this is uh, equal to the left-hand side. So for consistency, this can can only be one. So I'm forced to admit here with this expression that 2s must be an integer. But what happens is that there is this spin statistics relation that relates this s with the spin of this excitation. And in three spatial dimensions, this uh, s spin is determined by the eigenvalues of the angular momentum, which can be shown to be only integers and semi-integers. But in, in, in two spatial dimensions, the rotation group is a billion, is the one. So the spin can be anything. So how can we use, for example, this how can you compa make compatible this conclusion 
with the fact that in lower dimensions, the spinner statistics are not necessary integers. So the, re the, the, the way out is to put a face here, a face that will not make any difference if 2s is an integer. Because if 2s is an integer, this is 1. And this phase, epsilon, this is the, the, the sine function, is either plus or minus 1. So this is for an integer, is the same. But now, if we commute once more, we don't have any uh, inconsistency because now we have, if you are in one dimension, suppose x is less than y, then I have the first commutation is a positive phase, and the second commutation, if x is less than y, is, is the opposite phase. So for any value of s, this will be, uh, there is no inconsistency. And for the specific case of uh, 2s integers, it makes no difference. So this we take as our general statistics commutation rule. If the operators creating excitations with generalized statistics satisfy this commutation. Now go to 2 plus 1. So we find this function here. So we need we need to generalize this expression for two dimensions. For this, we must replace this phase here for, for something. So take this i function, which is in this is a complex plane. Suppose z is here and minus z is here. So this is arg z, and it's clear that argument of minus z is argument of z plus p. If z is in the upper part, now if z is in the lower part, like let's call w, now I have a minus sign here. So I immediately find this relation here. Epsilon is the sine function. So with this, we can define, generalize the commutation rule for generalized statistics like this. Instead of the sine function, I have now the sine of pi minus r. In such a way, since I am in two dimensions, the given x and y, either the arg of z is less or larger than, than pi. So this is. And now in three dimensions, okay, now in three dimensions, the function, the object that has a similar behavior is the, le consider a point x and a curve. Center, suppose a circle center on Y. So the solid angle determined between this point and the curve, such I, so suppose I have something like this. So I have a solid angle here, and uh, it, it's easy to, to see what I mean by this. So this solid angle has this property here, because, OK, so if I take this part, this x, across the curve, it, it suddenly changes sign. Okay. Okay, so I can define a generalized statistic commutation 
for this even three dimension, but notice that this is no longer a local object. It creates something which is on a curve. Now, on the limit, when this curve shrinks to a point, what happens? This solid angle goes to zero. When the solid angle goes to zero, this obviously is always less than 2 pi, and this epsilon factor becomes a constant. And I come back to the original commutation rules, which only allow for spin integer or semi-integer. So I can have generalized statistics in, in three dimensions for non-local objects. But at any point, I can take the local limit. And in this case, I recover fermions. Or bar. But I can have fermions expressed in terms of bosons. That's what I'm going to show. So let's make an overview of this structure in first in one spatial dimension. So I have this sigma, this V, this creates topological charge, this creates charge. They have this so-called dual algebra. If, and uh, if I define psi as a product of sigma and mu, I have this psi satisfying exactly the algebra which we just saw. So, bosonization is expressing this psi as this product, and both sigma and mu are expressed in terms of phi, and this phi is the momentum, canonically conjugated. Now in two dimensions. Again, I have the same sigma and mu. If I look at this commutation, I have this complicated object here. But this, I can write in this way. Okay. Using the cauchy riemann equation, I can write this, this, as this, and using integrating psi, I get that result. So again, in two dimensions, I can write a, a psi field in terms of a product of order of these other operators. And the statistics or spin of this field is a, a b over 2 pi. Uh, a and B are parameters which appear here. Now in three spatial dimensions, again, I have the sigma and mu operators, these A and B factors expressed in terms of the B field. I do the commutation of them, I get this. And now I need a three-dimensional generalization of the cauchy riemann equation, which this is the cauchy riemann equation. This is the higher dimension. It's an omega. So the cauchy riemann equation relates log and i. This equation relates this omega and the Coulomb potential. So this omega is the Dirac potential for the magnetic monopole. This rotation of omega is the Coulomb. Is the okay. So using this, we find in two dimensions the again the dual algebra. Observe that it involves, in general, this non-local operator. This is just so. So, in three dimensions, we can write this 
generalized the statistic algebra. But in the local limit, only spins integer and semi-integer are allowed. OK, now let's turn to the personalization of uh, a free direct fermion. So le 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 let's see what, what I, I mean here. So consider this generating function of current co correlated. So if I take the second derivative, so see, observe these are free direct fermions. If I couple the current to an external J mu, uh, this is going to give something like this. Uh, these are J's. So when I take the second derivative with respect to J and make J equals to zero, only the, the second term remains, the second. Uh, only the, the pi one, which is this loop here. So, so let's say one spatial dimension, let's call J mu, let's call this fermionic current, let's, call, let's express the fermionic current this way. So I have this, and let's try this Expect. Let's try to reproduce z of j by this, where a and k are to be determined. So if I integrate over phi, I immediately have this. And comparing to the, comparing to this, I immediately find that this relation here. And if I use the expression of pi 1, I immediately can write this here. And then I identify k with this, k squared is a. So this gives me the bosonic formula. So this is the bosonization of the current. This is the bosonization of the Lagrangian. So this game can be, can be played in higher demand. Yeah. With the A? No, no, they are the same. One is in momentum space and the other in coordinate. Okay. So in two dimensions, I write. Now the bosonic field is vector, so I write J in this way and write this. Well, now A mu nu and K mu nu are to be determined. So again, I integrate, I obtain this. So I have this relation. So this, are the bo we easily find this bosonic result. Now, pi 1 in two dimensions given by this. So these are the bosonic formula, bosonization of the Dirac fermion in two plus one dimension. Where B mu nu here is the, just the, so the B is a Maxwell-like field. Three dimensions. So now the bosonic field is a tensor. I have K these three indices, B, B, and A to be determined. So I integrate over B, get this, and again we have, this is the same game. I use C 
and I'm able to determine A and K where A where delta is given by this G is given by this and F is given by this. So we obtain the bosonization of a direct Fermi, free direct Fermi, the Lagrangian, the currents, and we can express this in terms of the Cobb Ramon field intensity terms. And this is bosonization of the current. In terms of serve, now in all of these examples, the upon bosonization, D electric charge, I mean the fermion charge, becomes the topological charge. That's why there is this duality. So the, okay, but observe that this previous sequence is, I, I got the bosonization of the Lagrangian and the current, but not the bosonization of the field itself. For this, I need that structure of sigmas and mu. So now we are going to really apply to vial fermions. So I decompose a Dirac Lagrange into left and right vial fermions in the vial representation. This uh, we have done before. Okay, so, so now I introduce this rapidity chi with which I can express the zero and k gamma. So in this way, I can write this I can write this structure here in this way. in terms of the rapidity, Pauli matrices and the unit vector. So I can write a left and right while fermions in this way. This is a kind of a pre-bosonization. And in terms of this, this field here, uh, this is a kind of a canonical transformation for little psi to big psi. And then I can write both the left and the right vial fermions in, in diagonal form. And the correlation functions uh, easily obtain it from that. So if this is the Lagrangian, the correlation function is just the inverse of this function. Uh, so this is very easy to find. So I get this correlators here. And the, the crosses are, are zero. So the vial Lagrangians are bosonized in this way. We have a right and a left Abramon field. So this again, Lagrangian bosonization. This is summed in left and right. This is in turn. B mu is a, is a tensor gauge field. We transform in this way under gauge transformation. Okay, so I have, okay, I have the left current given by this. This is an identical conservative current, but in the presence of an electromagnetic field, I have these extra terms here, which combine in such a way that when we, we 
compute the usual fermion current with some discrete terms, they will cancel. But when we compute the chiral current, we have this identity conserver plus the sign mean. So, okay, this this is. And the current, as I said, this has just, so the identically conserved part gives this. So, the, the conservation of the chiral current, so we see that this is just this, but this is non-zero. This is so-called champion Triagin, topological charge density. So this is the famous adler bell jacquiv axial anomaly, which, as we have seen, has been observed in these semi-metals in the framework of condensed matter. So field bosonization, we use that same structure of uh, operator mu, uh, operator sigma, I expressing in terms of these tau Ramon fields. And so we can compute correlators of this. This is in spite of apparently complicated, but this is just quadratic because these are free, so supposed to be free vial fermions. So the vial correlators we have seen are given by this. But if I compute the bosonized version, I get these three terms which boil up to this. And if I choose A and B in this way, I obtain exactly that correlation. So, and this can be done for all correlators. So I can reproduce all the correlators of the vial fermion in the framework of this bosonic field. Now there is this famous left-right imbalance in vial semi-atoms. So this, as I said, comes because the divergence of this difference is non-zero. And therefore, if we take the, the charge density, the density, if I use the continuity equation, is given by this, and this is given by this, if we use the, the champion diagonal. So, we find this differential equation. Now, if we allow a backscattering, so this, this equation tells us how the left uh, vial fermions migrate to become right. But if we allow a backscattering with a time char characteristic tau, we get this expression here. So the average delta is proportional to E, tau and V. As a magnetoconductance, if, if we look at the conductivity Kubus formula, if we use this J uh, Okay, this J in the presence of electric and magnetic fields are going to be here. So this will enhance the current for peculiar electric and magnetic fields. And this has been observed experimentally. So finally, we can try to apply this method to electrons themselves, because electrons, as we saw, are direct fields with a left and a right 
uh, vile fermions. So the free direct Lagrangian with bosonizer like that, the current like that, and the electrons have a mass term will be something like this. So this will be a kind of a sine Gordon. So this <laughs> is still a very preliminary result, but it goes in the direction of that dream of skirm. The gauge transformations, by the way, of the B field will, I mean, this the gauge transformation that the electron field suffers, which is a U1, the phase would be given by this uh, circulation of this lambda on the curve C, which is nothing but the flux of something uh, along it. Yes, yeah, because this will be the, the, the flux of magnetic field, magnetic like field defined like this. Okay. That's what I said. So I come to the 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 end. So in condensed matter physics, after uh, almost one century of vile work, these vile excitations have been observed in these materials. Uh, we can describe very easily in the bosonizer framework the anomalous transport, like the magneto conductor or negative magneto resistance, which would be called magneto conductor. And in particle physics, there are some exciting possibilities. I don't like to see physics as divided in different uh, compartments. I like to see physics as one. So like, for example, we have the Higgs mechanism, Anderson Higgs mechanism, is nothing but the Meissner effect in superconductivity. The Yukawa mechanism that provides mass to uh, quarks and leptons, uh, or the mass that we know in our daily life, the Yukawa mechanism is precisely the pyrals mechanism that provides a gap to polyacetylene is exactly the same. So we have the same mechanism working on a scale, on systems separated by orders of magnitude in energy. So uh, uh, I believe that physics is just one, not <laughs> I used to say that wh when I was uh, starting in physics by the time of my PhD, wh when I was doing my PhD, uh, particle physicists, I mean, let's say, condensed matter physics wouldn't believe in quarks, and particle physicists wouldn't believe in phonons. <laughs> so but fortunately, this situation, of course, this is, <laughs> is just a joke, but it expresses more or less the atmosphere at that time. These times, fortunately, have gone. And now uh, I think physics is seen much more as a unity. And I end with this phrase here. Thank you very much. <laughs>